Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, and joining me today is new USC Associate Head Coach, Lee Maurer. Lee, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you about USC, but uh, we're, we're going to, I, I want to talk about your swimming career first. You uh, are a two-time Olympic medalist, uh, Olympic champion from the 1992 games. Um, can you tell me a little bit about just your swimming background and how you got to be interested in the sport? Uh, yeah, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, I have a long, I feel like I have nine lives in swimming, but I, I'm the sixth of seven. I grew up in a house with one and a half baths and, um, <laughs> I swam with John Collins growing up from nine to basically 49. He's been my coach. And, um, he is wired where, you know, he wants you to dream big at the highest level. So I was fortunate enough to kind of be thrown into um, the Badger environment, swimming under uh, Rick Carey. And so I um, have definitely been exposed to the highest level from a very young age. So I swam with John growing up. Um, that was, you know, obviously phenomenal. He always wanted me to win nationals. Interesting fact, I didn't win U.S. nationals until after the Olympics. So <laughs> he clearly uh, set really ambitious goals for me. And then um, lesser known fact, I went to uh, University of Florida for a year and swam for Randy Reese. And then when he resigned, um, so as a freshman, I got second in both events. Um, I was um they talk about failing gloriously i was winning the 200 backstroke by a monster amount ahead of american record place uh right until kristen linehan passed me gloriously um <laughs> my teammate uh and then ninth in the 200 im and then he left um i left with him redshirted um when that was a thing and then paid for stanford for a year um then uh earned a scholarship and swam on the stanford team under Richard Quick, and that obviously was a dream come true. Um, made the Olympic team with Jenny and Summer and so many other of my Stanford um, women friends, and met my husband. And, you know, that was um, kind of, you know, my happily ever after, um, you know, into 92. What attracted you after, after um, Randy retired at Florida, you took a redshirt year. What, what attracted you about? the Stanford particularly? Yeah, so that was interesting. Um, my transferring was rough, as you could imagine, um, with the change in coaching. And so um, I definitely, it was not a year that I wish upon anyone, but I grew up tremendously as a young woman. I definitely thought, you know, there's people who say, wow, you have talent, or you might be able to get a scholarship. And here I was in a situation that, um, uh, I didn't know where I was going. Uh, my world was really upside down a little bit. And um, I didn't know if I really wanted to swim anymore because I was a little disenchanted. And um, so I looked at the Ivies and I looked at Stanford and I decided to pay for Stanford because I knew that if it came around that I did want to pursue my athletic dreams, that that would give me the best opportunity to achieve it. And so that was um, the driving factor. But in those days when you were redshirting, um, you know, you were kind of on your own. And luckily, Skip Kenny adopted me when the women's team traveled. And, um, and it was the best thing for me. I think, why do I swim? Um, and do I believe in myself? So I grew up and I'm not sure I would have made the Olympic team without kind of that, that growth year. Yeah. You, 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 you've now said twice you paid for Stanford. Did you pay for Stanford out of pocket for yourself? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, my parents helped. Um, but yeah, I had loans. And, um, you know, I, I feel good about that. And um, yeah, <laughs> so when you're the six of seven, um, you know, that's, I don't know, you, you kind of are on your own at 18, um, more than than later in life. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a huge family. Did your, 
did your family have a have a history of swimming? Did did your older siblings swim? Did you follow them into it? I know that's certainly how I got into the sport. Um, Definitely. Um, my father uh, was a champion rower. He won um, U.S. nationals in single skull, and um, then there was a drought, and he started swimming. So he swam with New York Athletic Club, um, and that was a big part of what helped us kind of be a swimming family. Is he got an athletic membership, so we were little pool rats and. Um, yeah, my sister went to UVA. She was a rower, Catherine. And then Lynn went to um, Northeastern. Jeanette went to Manhattanville. Eileen Rutgers, my brother John to Brown. Um, then I went to Florida Stanford. And then my little brother James went to Cal for a year and then transferred to Syracuse. So a uh, big swimming family. <laughs> did, did, did they, how many of your siblings swim in college? Uh, Lynn, Jeanette, uh, Eileen didn't or did for some John, myself and James. So I'd say <laughs> somewhere between five and six. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Uh, big <laughs> I'll quiz you thing. later on the names. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm, you know, you were slowing down a little. I'm not even sure that you can knit, rattle them all <laughs> off in sequential order. Um, you got, yeah. I mean, I mean, I feel like I, I feel like I'm in goodwill hunting when he has 13 siblings. Yes. Uh, I love that movie. <laughs> It's a great, it's a great <laughs> film. Watch Goodwill Hunting if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, yes. A great way to spend your quarantine. So, so you have this great swimming career. You, you go to the Olympics. Um, you, you were on the Olympic team with Mel Stewart, our co-founder. He couldn't be here today. He wanted to, but um, give us, give us a little taste onto what your Olympic experience was like. Uh, so I was probably a dark horse. Janie Wagstaff, um, was obviously, you know, kind of, she had a YouTube video with Christina Agerzegri and, um, I wasn't picked to make the team, you know, um, back in the day, Swimming World would pick and I was, um, not, I don't even know if I was picked to make the top eight. And so then when I made the Olympic team, um, you know, kind of the, the press was, you know, wow, she kind of exceeded ex expectations, but um, probably going to be, a, a, you know, not a threat at the um, Barcelona Olympics. And then that was an interesting year. I don't know if everybody knows, but the Olympic trials happened a week before NC2As. And then the summers, um, the Olympics were in, you know, kind of uh, the July. And so for me, that was a great situation because I made it in March. The monkey was kind of off my back. Um, I wasn't really getting that much attention, but it wasn't a question of, am I going to make it? Um, I knew that I was going um, and I made really good strides, I think technically and, um, and kind of mentally in terms of just eye on the prize on just focusing on doing the best time. And then um, I just kept making huge strides in that time frame, And I think Janie, you know, had kind of a lot of press, a lot of hype, a lot of pressure. Um, she also, you know, was American record holder. I mean, she was just um, nails and I really like her. But when we went to the um, Olympics, you know, I, I ended up doing uh, a faster time in prelims. And um, I remember that was my first positive press was Edgar Zegi got invited. And at that point, I was Lee Loveless. And she said, after prelims, I knew Lee Loveless was dangerous. Um, so I was like, kept that clipping. I was like, sweet, positive press. Um, <laughs> and then um, in the 100 back, I vividly remember, you know, I was uh, really racing well. And I got to the 15 meter mark. And I just like my heart took over and my brain just kind of um, cramped and I was like oh my gosh like I'm doing really well in like 15 minutes and uh yeah like both Hungarians passed me and I got third I was still happy with it but um I definitely knew and that was when the dream team was there so Charles Barkley you kind of come back and he was one that wasn't always in the hotel and he was in the kind of athlete area and you know, he's like, oh my gosh, I've heard this saying, pianos fall. And he's like, how many pianos hit you, Lee? You know, and so it was kind of funny. And then at the relay, I got to redeem myself. Um, and I broke the American record leading off the medley relay. And we broke um, the world record that was set by the East Germans. And, um, you know, it was myself, Anita Null, Chrissy Amon-Layton, and Jenny Thompson. So um, all of us kind of probably wanted to 
rewrite our individual events and we came out with um, a spectacular medley relay. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you guys won by three seconds, new world record. Uh, it, see, you know, looking at it on paper, it seems like it, it was it was a really nice way to go out. Um, and those guys are friends for life, you know, just from that experience, but more the ready room and we were loose and, um, you know, it's always what you wish for as an athlete. It's just hard to execute always. Yeah. So, so after, you know, you talked about kind of having, having waffling on whether you even wanted to swim going into 92, going into Stanford. And then, um, as I see it, you, you kept swimming for another six to eight years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, when I did that, um, so yeah, what next? Well, then that was interesting, right? So now I'm the American record holder. Um, I went to the Olympics and had kind of this storybook season. Um, I go back to Stanford. I, you know, have um, two more great, um, I think that was my junior year. So I have one more great um, NC2A um, hunt, which I love that meet. It's my all-time favorite meet. Um, and then I, in that year, I got my master's in education. Um, but I definitely felt as if that was just the beginning. I mean, it was the first year people even knew who Lee Lovos was. And um, yeah, so I, I, I love swimming. I mean, it is um, my lifeline. And, um, you know, I definitely have love of the game, you know, mostly for the relationships and that kind of thing. So I graduated from college. And again, my parents are older, and it was time for you to get a job. It was a time where professional swimming wasn't really an option. So I went to Northwestern, and I was an assistant coach there. Um, and uh, then that was not uh, kind of a perfect match. So I thought I missed the academic piece, but then I came out, tried to make 96, um, had a very disappointing 96 Olympic trials, um, went back, got my teaching certificate, um, became an English teacher and a high school swim coach where I coached Mac Reavers at uh, Lake Forest, um, got engaged. And again, John Collins coming in. So he talked me into um, coming and help coach at a meet. And at that point, you know, everyone's like, oh, all brides lose weight. And I was like, sweet. I thought this was like the empirical truth. So I was like, oh, let's try the cakes. Let's like try these meals. So <laughs> it's not an empirical truth. <laughs> and I was one of the only brides who like ate my way through the wedding planning. Um, and so John was like, whoa, <laughs> I don't know what um, less than PC thing he communicated to me at that time. But he's like, I think maybe you should uh, get back in the pool and get ready for your wedding. Um, and I went to help them at a meet in Fort Lauderdale. And I used to love that meet. They used to kind of run a uh, beginning of the summer meet. And he entered me. And it was kind of this guffaw, guffaw moment of, okay. And I swam, like, incredibly considering the situation I was in, but pretty well. And he said, you know what? Oh, let's like go to nationals and, and see what happens. And I had accepted the full-time position as an English teacher and a coach. And that was the nationals at national at Nashville when the bulkhead broke and the lights went out. My meet, my event was after the men's hundred free, the bulkhead broke. They like pushed it back. Then there was a protest on whether it was accurate or not. The lights went out. I don't think I swam until 1230. And I was just like, this is just a circus. And I ended up from like lane seven, getting second and making world championships at Perth. Um, and I, like, I'm not emotional, but I'm just like, what is going on? <laughs> like, I feel like I live a clean life. <laughs> not sure what this is. Um, so then I had this full-time job, first year teaching. And it was during um, Christmas, you know, kind of exam time that I would miss. And I went to administration and said, you know, can I miss? They let me, I went to Perth, I rebroke the American record um, that I hadn't broken since the 1992 Olympics. And, you know, usually I'm like, oh, focus on your kicks, maybe break the American record. I literally said to myself, complete two laps <laughs> <laughs> efficiently. And even USA Swimming Timer was like, holy beep, you know, like <laughs> this time I was a dark horse. And I never really celebrate, but I celebrated and then it dawned on me that I had finals coming up, but I eked out the win and it was this amazing kind of 
career. Then I had to keep going till 2000 and I got third in 2000 and uh, that officially was the end. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Talk about a career in a nutshell. That's, I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's such a cool story though. So, so one more question um, about, about your career, you know, you're teaching, you're coaching full-time. How, like, what, how did your training change during that period? Um, you know, are you, are you managing two a days? Were you training once a day, yeah, once was, a week? <laughs> no, what? I was, um, yeah, I, I trained some with the high school teams. Um, and I feel like, you know, that was really good. You know, you had to kind of model, model what you would expect. So it kept me, um, you know, really on the straight and narrow. Um, but other days I just swim, you know, literally 35 minutes straight. Um, it's the first time I started recording uh, my training because it was so unorthodox, but I had success and a few coaches would say, wow, I'd love to see your log. And I was like, what? <laughs> and they're like, oh, don't you keep a log of all your workouts? And um, I, I hadn't, but then um, as a coach, I've kept logs since then. Um, uh, but that was, um, I think, you know, I had this renewed appreciation. I talked with Jenny about, she was my roommate then. And, um, you know, the lesser known story, but, you know, at that point, so many coaches are like, oh, you have to eat well, you know, at the final meet and, you know, you start getting nervous, but I didn't have to make my meals. I was getting massages. I was like, this is the best. I don't have to go to work. I'm getting massages. Meals are taken <laughs> care of. Um, and Jenny, you know, she was like, I really want this dessert. She got some huge waffle Sunday, and she ended up winning the 100 free and she was having the meat of her life and we're a little superstitious. So she's like, it's the dessert. <laughs> I didn't swim until day three and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to roll out of there but the dessert maybe it's the secret recipe <laughs> <laughs> there you go if you if you're gonna win world championships have waffle sundays yes um well that i mean that's that in itself is inspiring to no end uh but that's it's a very cool story you you officially retire in 2000 um, and that's, it, would you say that's kind of when you started focusing more on coaching? hundred percent. I mean, obviously, and, but I think I draw a lot from my experience. Um, and I, you know, I am Catholic, um, true and true. And I believe that, you know, I've been given a gift and I wanted to see it come to fruition. And then, um, I believe that I've been given a gift uh, as a coach and I want to have a responsibility to give back to young athletes and let them find, um, you know, have maximized their talent, whether that's, you know, breaking a minute and a hundred fly or whether it's um, winning an Olympic gold. And, um, you know, I see it as an act of service and I love it. Um, I appreciate how much swimming has given to me, obviously, in terms of the scholarship and um, my husband, and obviously it's a big part of my um, two children's life, Luke and Rex. So, you know, we're a swimming family, but I believe it's, um, it's magical and, and I want to help that, you know, kind of pass that on to other people. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's talk about your, your, your coaching at Stanford. Um, you get there at 2005. Is, is that what to you, is that kind of a dream come true to be the head coach at your alma mater? Definitely. Um, I mean, that was probably unexpected from everybody in the country when I got that. But, um, you know, obviously, I felt as if I knew what Richard Quick did very well as a swim coach. And I felt as if I also knew um, some things that I could attend to um, and, and kind of um, make the program even better or return it into a winning program. And so, obviously, um, you know, my my experience at Stanford was tremendous and I wanted to replicate that in many ways. And then I wanted to improve upon it, um, in other ways. And so again, you know, um, I, you know, my kind of motto is the better stories we have, the faster we're going to swim. And I'm a story based person. And I think we, um, I want to know the, the stories of all my athletes and I want us to kind of rewrite a new chapter and then continue our story um as a, as kind of in a relationship with each other and obviously with me and and the athletes that i work with are you friends with carol capitani 
I am. Yes. <laughs> that sounds like a Carolism to me. <laughs> she might have stolen it from me. I don't know. <laughs> Ooh. That 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 sounds like something Carol would say. We've we've talked a lot about stories, and and I think that's that's a very cool perspective to have. I I'm I'm all aboard the story train. Um, nice. Were so so that first year, you know, were you surprised? Were you overwhelmed? Did you feel right at home? Did you feel like your athletes were receptive um, to, to a new head coach? Um, I think the athletes, yeah, the athletes were very receptive. Um, I think there was, I mean, I think probably if I had to kind of identify, um, it was um, obviously meeting individual goals that was um, important to me, but within the context of the team. So we um, had a renewed commitment to the team, um, to the team hunt. Um, kind of some pieces of the Stanford culture that, that I really subscribed to um, when I was there and I brought back was, you know, um, President Kennedy, he used to always say, we do not venerate heroes here at Stanford. So humility was a big part of um, our culture. Um, and then also kind of um, feeling as if, right, we wanted many legs on the table. So I want them to be great swimmers, um, great people, uh, great students um and have great you know um professional careers and i think we worked really hard at that um but everyone was um incredibly supportive i think obviously coming from stanford and having gone through um that university there were other other um, coaches who knew me when i was an athlete i you know went to office hours with carol dweck i mean i kind of borrowed from my stanford experience which i'm not sure that many coaches um, even kind of knew how to do that. But I think that was something that a lot of coaches loved was I bridged the gap between some of the amazing um, academic people that were available. Um, and sometimes those two sides don't talk, but um, I kind of forced the conversation because uh, that's just how I had lived there. And so I continue to live there, live like that when I was a coach there. Yeah. If, if you have a, I know this might be a big question, but, you know, if you have a training philosophy as a coach, um, you know, what areas do you feel like you specialize in or, or how do you feel like w what training works best for most athletes to you? Um, I don't know. People used to say I could only work at Stanford because they would say you need an engineering degree to understand my, my uh, workouts. Um, I don't think I did some sort of like aptitude training and I love mastery. Um, I am very creative, so only on a few test sets will I repeat. Um, and I think my philosophy is obviously, um, you know, to be the best in the world or, you know, to kind of get, be your best. Um, a common saying is, are you your best self? So I believe that those two hours that we have in the pool um, or three hours when you're there, it's a really sacred time. So you walk down and this is your sport. Um, I want athletes to feel a real sense of agency in their life. It's some place where no one um, had control over what I did. It was um, my sport, my two hours. Um, and that's a huge part is um, kind of the, the sanctity of that moment and the sport in terms of um, feeling like it's clean um, and it's yours um, and ours in terms of um, it's an, a me, you, pro like, team and then also the collective team um i think those are kind of the pillars of me yeah so you just said you don't really repeat sets very much this might so this might be a dead-end question but do you have a, a favorite set you've ever written or, or or one that you that went over better than you expected it to um i did like one set where we were at Stanford and we combined um, men and women and we had two people in every lane and I had uh, a sprint group, a middle group and a distance group and they raced the entire set uh, two times. Um, the distance people, they would start um, with the shorter distance and um, no, they would start with the uh, longer distance and go to the shorter distance. The sprinters would start with um, the shorter distance and go to the longer distance and the middle maybe had the worst. They probably had like bookends of longer, but the idea was you had to race the entire time, but chase after the person who was the lead 
the lead person. So if they're going 50s and they're going 100s and they're going 200s, they had to try and race. But that was one of my uh, big successes in terms of uh, getting Skip to let me put my hands on the men um, and the women. And um, yeah, I mean, the second round, the first round was magical. The second round there <laughs> may have been some uh, descent. <laughs> some casualties. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, yeah. And so things like that where everyone feels a little bit of success and a little bit of um, hunger for um, feeling like we could get better. Things like that are kind of my, you know, my MO. Yeah. Um, so you, I mean, during your time there, you coached a lot of great athletes. Um, did you, do you have a highlight moments, you know, from the NCAA meet, which, which was your favorite meet, um, as an athlete, was it still your favorite meet as a coach? I think I have some biological response, February and March. Um, I mean, my kids, the, the, it was, you know, stepping away was one of the hardest decisions of my life. And <laughs> the first few years, they were just like, oh gosh, it's championship season. <laughs> I don't know if I should have run a marathon. You know, I mean, I have gotten ready for February and March for a majority of my life in some way. Um, so I am really excited about getting back and having a, um, outlet for that energy um, it is hardwired in me um, and obviously you know the NC2A whereas my first recruiting class with um, you know 10 freshmen um, and when they were seniors we missed out winning by two and a half points and um, obviously you know I, I wish that they had had the Cinderella story of the win but um, that meet just in terms of, you know, so many people coming up and saying, wow, like you renewed my faith that we can win with a small team. I'm not sure I wanted, you know, other people to believe. I kind of wanted us to believe that, but um, I do feel as if I rekindled the faith and like it can be done, um, you know, and it's, and it's happening. Um, so that was, you know, really, you know, just people who had signed on for Lee, signed on for what I was offering. Um, you know, Elaine named her daughter Julia. So I think kind of those pieces that I'm hoping for, um, they're all incredibly close and I've gone to a lot of weddings. So that kind of is the culminating, um, you know, meet. And I think it continued on in, in many ways. And, and so that that's one of my favorites in terms of feeling like I built it up and, um, and made it better. Just to be clear, Elaine Breeden, uh, yes. your former, former 200 butterflyer, named her daughter Julia after Julia Smith, her teammate. I don't. I I'm gonna go with that. I don't know. It depends on what day you ask them. There's probably... oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's after Julia, but they have um, they have an incredible uh, relationship and and a lot of uh, a lot of humor back and forth on those two. <laughs> That, that is awesome. And, and, and as a coach, I'm sure that's, that's a really cool thing to see. Um, so you mentioned stepping away, you know, you Definitely. were at Stanford uh, seven years, 05 to 12. Correct. Um, can you take yeah. us through that decision to step down as the head coach? Yeah, I mean, that was, um, like you said, um, a dream come true. I felt like we were cooking with gas. Um, I definitely uh professionally i loved my job uh personally my husband is a partner at a private equity firm uh, that's based out of chicago and he was traveling back and forth through the entire time that i was the coach there and then um you know uh parenting is important to me and the rules had changed so much that uh it was hard to send children um to events just with the coaches and i you know i'll vividly remember, you know, Luke saying, I'm not going to go with Blanca to swim meets. Um, and so, um, you know, morally, I knew that I was, uh, I think I, when I coached, they're all, you know, become part of my family. And I was giving the best of my optimism and my love and support to the team. And when I came home, um, and, you know, and I had big gaps, where um, I was looking at kind of the time frame and all of the really successful athletes that I worked with felt as if their parents were committed to them and available for them. I interviewed so many um, female coaches 
probably the best model I came up with was um, women basketball coaches. Um, but a lot of them had husbands that were staying home. And um, yeah, like, I love my profession. I couldn't out earn <laughs> Eric, unfortunately, even though it's a, it's a premier job. And I didn't want to look back and feel as if, I mean, um, that I didn't do everything I could to help my um, children pursue their dreams. So um, morally, you know, I was um, compelled to take a step back. Um, professionally, that is, um, was hard. Um, and luckily, I had a really good relationship with John Vargas, who's the water polo coach at Stanford. And he knew um, kind of the conundrum I was in. And, um, and so I became the volunteer assistant of men's water polo. And I don't know anything about water polo, but I, I know swimming. And so that has been like a really creative piece to my life. So I would fly out there from August to December and write um, kind of three week, you know, kind of um, training plans. And they won in C2As last year. So that was exciting. But um, obviously this year that didn't look like it was a feasible option. Yep. That, and that makes sense. <laughs> um, so at the time, how old were your two sons in 2012? Um, yeah. So Luke was born 2001 and Rex was born 2004. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and so, so, so you, you took this time off. You can, your uh, successor, Greg Meehan, uh, you can be honest, we, you know, what do you think of the job he's done so far and, and don't, oh, don't no, hold any yeah. punches. <laughs> yeah. uh, there, you know, his <laughs> results and Tracy, you know, it's uh, speaking for themselves. I think, you know, I'm not sure whether uh, he would concede this, but there aren't that many people who leave a job and hope that the program has success. So um, Stanford's a huge part of my life. I'm friends with everyone on that staff. I think, um, you know, and I wanted, I, you know, I left it, the, the kitchen in good order. I think I tried to leave some things that were helpful for him. And I'm not sure there's any other human being who came in and, um, and there was kind of any, any sort of, um, you know, good seeds or goodwill. Um, but I felt really good about, um, you know, where the program and obviously um, they've taken it um, to a beautiful level and it's fantastic for them. So um, he deserves all the credit for the success that they've had. Um, but I do think that um, it was, you know, I, I think it, it was um, given to him um, in a state where not many programs are, are given to people. I think there's usually a reason for the transition. And this one was um, personal, which is, I think, unusual. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was totally kidding. Greg Meehan, great guy. Uh, <laughs> I, I like him a lot. Um, yeah. so, so, so that, that leads us to now, um, you're back in the coaching game. You're going to USC, which I mean, that, that kind of has to feel a little odd for you, right? <laughs> going to a PAC 12 rival. <laughs> I've gotten it from both ends. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, right. I mean, when you're kind of strong Stanford, there is a um, strong anti-USC sentiment in the Pac-12. So um, uh, that, that is ironic in many ways. But, um, you know, right, leaving was hard, but coming back was one of the easiest decisions of my life. I got to coach a little bit um, during the pandemic. We went to Florida and I got on deck um, and I had a fire in my belly. My uh, two boys swim at Northwestern, so I've watched. Um, Jeremy and Megan and the rest of his staff at Northwestern. Um, you know, I, I liked some things that I saw. Um, he went, you know, got the job at USC and I reached out to him because um, obviously, you know, um, I'm wired where the balance of academics and athletics is um, a big part of my life and my composition and also friends for life. Um, and you know, I, I also, like I said, I'm wired to where I want to be in the hunt. I want to believe that I'm at an institution where I could be in the hunt, um, you know, that they support that pursuit. Um, and then you're looking at kind of um, a small number of, of programs, maybe. And, you know, and, and we, we had some really good conversations. I thought we lined up on a lot of things. And I thought he was willing to kind of um, yeah, let me read the map and plan the warfare a little bit, um, which is my dream time. And so I feel really good about um, kind of where we are and where we're going. Yeah. 
So, so moving forward, I guess to, to wrap this conversation up, where do you feel like you're going? Where, where would you like to go? I mean, aside from obviously a national title, but, um, you know, what, what, what do you think USC has that maybe, maybe, uh, you didn't get the opportunity to do at Stanford? Yeah, I think that we have, you know, a little bit of a better opportunity to have a little more diversity in terms of just um, the people that we're working with and kind of um, the profile of your teammates. And then I also think, um, you know, they get to have certainty earlier in terms of, you know, if they are, we've got some friends who have uh, children who have committed to USC. And, um, and so I think maybe they get to kind of uh, take the pedal off the metal in terms of the uncertainty of, am I going to get in? And there are some really strong student athletes who want to know early and get that done. Um, and I think, you know, maybe a little bit more balance. Maybe you get to go to the beach on a Wednesday and a Saturday um, and, and that's okay. So I'm hoping to pick up some surfing and uh, yeah, maybe, you know, have a little more balance in terms of um, the fun stuff that we're able to do. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, Lee. Any any parting thoughts before we uh, we end this conversation? No, I have to work on my fight on. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, and, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing what you guys do it down at uh, down in Southern Cal. All right, we're looking forward to wowing you. Thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.